Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, Jennifer Mackin and I have a conversation on the recent comments by Tesla and SpaceX founder Elon Musk that the biggest problem with corporate America today is that too many MBAs are running the show. Is he right? Jennifer Mack, and welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. Love talking about leadership in any capacity. Thanks for having me. Yeah, me too. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, talking about leadership is something I can do nonstop all day, every day. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, sometimes people have to rein me in a bit. My wife tells me, you know, if, if you're talking for more than like 10 minutes without anyone else saying anything, you need to just be <laughs> quiet. <laughs> so I have to try to remind myself. Um, well, Jennifer, it's, it's really a pleasure to be with you today. You have a great background. And I was really intrigued when we first got connected, the idea was floated that we explore the recent comments by Elon Musk about the biggest problem in corporate America today being that there's too many MBAs running the show. That's a really kind of provocative statement. Um, I'm going to link to, to an article about this in, in the show notes. Um, and, and really, you know, for both of us as, as people with advanced degrees, um, you know, we will bring our own kind of take and, uh, point of view to his comments talking about where perhaps maybe he, he's not seeing some value, but in other ways where he, he's making some good points and it's worth us really considering, um, so that's going to be our, our conversation today. As we get started, I just wanted to share Jennifer's bio with everybody. Jennifer Mackin is a Forbes book author of Leader Deserve Better, a leadership development revolution, and a leader of two consulting firms, CEO of Oliver Group Inc. and president uh, and partner of Leadership Pipeline Institute U.S., as an author and speaker with over 25 years of consulting experience, she is a recognized leadership development influencer, having worked with CEOs, human resource managers, leadership development leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, and other senior leaders in all industries. She earned her BS in marketing from Indiana University and her MBA from Owen School of Management at Vanderbilt University. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining me. Before we really launch into the conversation, anything else that you would like to share by way of personal background or, or context? I think you shared a lot of my background and people can find that a little bit easy, easily. But um, one thing I was thinking about as you were talking is that I, I've learned about myself um, and thought about recently is that I'm really a change agent at heart. And I really like challenge and complexity and really status quo just isn't an option in my book. Um, but I also believe that leadership development for all of us is a journey, a lifelong journey. And so I've dedicated my career to helping people, helping businesses, which also ultimately helps the communities that they're in reach their best um, and performs at their best. So I think kind of connecting what I've done in my career to why I keep doing this and why I wrote this book, that's, that's kind of the why for me. So I love change and we've had a lot of it recently and a lot of people, um, I find it stimulating, but a lot of people are flat footed by it. Um, and so I think leadership is needed more than ever right now. Well, I completely agree with that. Um, and I share your, your orientation and passion. Um, I think, I think we all, um, have the potential to be really meaningful and impactful change agents. 
uh, and it doesn't require formal leadership roles or a position in hierarchy. We all have the opportunity to influence. We all have the opportunity to, to make a difference. And, and so when we start to frame our, our existence and our professional life that way, um, I, I think it, it, it changes the game in terms of, like you mentioned, how, how many people get caught flat-footed. Ma many people are more comfortable with the status quo. Um, I yeah. also am one that I kind of get bored with that. And so I, I want to, to continually try to improve things and help people maximize their potential, um, yeah. or, organizations and individuals. And, you know, whether, whether you see yourself as that person who's going to change the world or not, I, I don't think that's what we're talking about per se. It's, it's really just about seeing the role you play within your sphere of influence. You have the capacity to change your life for the better, your families, your communities, um, your team, you know, your workplace, you can do it. And, and so that's really where a lot of, of my energy goes as well. I know yours does. Yeah. Um, so I, we have similar whys, I guess is my point. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it. It sounds like it. And, you know, um, mostly it's one-to-one -one kind of learning. And I think with podcasts, with, with the books, um, that can reach one to many, which gets me excited, you know, to share our thoughts um, with many people instead of just one-to-one, -one, although that has to continue and we have to learn from them as well. So. Yeah, for sure. And another thing you said, um, you know, when you referenced being flat-footed, um, the pandemic has really shaken things up. It's, it's turned people's worlds upside down and no doubt about it. It's created a lot of challenges for a lot of people. Um, health challenges, mental and emotional health challenges, uh, certainly economic challenges, uh, lots, lots of, of difficult things people are dealing with. And I would never want to minimize any of that pain and suffering that people, um, are, are trying to grapple with. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, th there really has been a tremendous amount of opportunity that has come out of this environment that we're in. Uh, and for those who are a little bit more agile and a little bit more um, comfortable with ambiguity and complexity and um, are willing to embrace change, I, I think this has really provided us a lot of opportunities. And I know a lot of people tune into this podcast for that very reason. They, they want to, to, think about new ways of framing their experiences, perhaps new uh, tips and tricks and best practices, things that they can do just to, to make the most of the moment that they're in. And I think yeah. ultimately that's what we're both all about. Yeah, yeah, and we're, and we're talking today about what makes a top leader successful um, in terms of background, but what I've seen through the pandemic in particular is that if, if leaders move quickly, through this in terms of recognizing how it affects their lives and their businesses and making change happen, communicating that throughout the organization and doing it quickly, they have been on a whole, you know, winning through this, even though it's probably one of the more difficult things they've ever done. And those that are receiving information on a daily basis and then saying, okay, well, how does this affect my business vaccines being the one that's most recent, you know, and, and how, it, how are we going to handle that as an organization? And, um, but, but really responding confidently and quickly and in, being informed has really separated those who have done well and some, some who've struggled, some have struggled just because of the kind of industry they're in. But, but I think it takes that, those types of things to be a good leader through, through this change and others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Decision paralysis has been a thing that has afflicted many leaders for for ages, right? That's nothing yeah. new, but when you find yourself in a hyper um, kind of complex um, shifting kind of landscape, that can that can really exacerbate that challenge that people have. And so I think we've all seen that. Some people who've really stepped up to the challenge and been able to thrive within, you know, uh, maybe thrives the wrong word, but at least be able to navigate effectively mm -hmm. uh, the situation and others who, who have kind of moved into a, you know, just, they're, they're just so bombarded with information and shifts daily that they've had a hard time making the, the necessary adjustments. Yeah. So. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. You can feel lost in that, in that information. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
Well, so let's pivot now a little bit and talk about, again, what, what does it mean to be successful? And the provocative statement by Elon Musk was that the biggest problem with corporate America today is that too many MBAs are running the show. So, so <laughs> no, I mean, often we think about MBA and MBAs as being one of those degrees that business leaders need to get so that they have the competencies and capabilities to successfully lead an organization in all the core facets, right? Uh, that's what an MBA does it, it, is it prepares you in the, in terms of the finance um, um, elements and, and it helps you with the people management pieces and the marketing pieces. It, it rounds you out as a leader. So you have a, a, a good in-depth understanding of all those areas and then you can specialize and go into different, um, uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that sounds good, doesn't it? So what's, what's the problem? Where do you yeah. think he's coming from when he's talking about, um, corporate America's decline or, or the, the difficulties that we face coming from too many MBAs running the show. Right. You know, uh, having an MBA myself, my first response was like, that's not right. You know, um, he's also a very successful entrepreneur and, um, nobody can say otherwise. Um, so I think it's a pretty broad statement, uh, that he's made, but it also, there's some merit there. And I think it's unfair in a lot of, in a lot of ways. So I don't know anybody with an MBA that disregards product or their customers. And so kind of with underneath why he believes that was that, that MBA leaders focus too much on financials, focus too much of their time in the boardroom, and less time with their customers on the front line, with their people, and focused on their products. Um, so, you know, I don't believe you need an advanced degree in order to be successful and to be well-rounded, as he's mentioning, as you're suggesting um, an MBA does. It doesn't mean that those with an MBA come out and leverage all of those things um, because it's very easy, I think, to focus on the financial aspect, but it's a lagging indicator of success. So, um, so I think there are pros and cons to, to what he's saying. Um, I was thinking back to my time at Vanderbilt's um, MBA program, and, and I think a couple of things um, make this ring true for me, what he's saying, um, and that is I see that professors can often be really academic um, versus practical and bring, you know, real experiences. Um, and I had this unique experience of having leveraged this behavioral assessment, and you may know about it. It's called Predictive Index. And it measures just style and, you know, um, just general how people approach the work that they do. And so I had the opportunity to give that survey to a lot of my classmates, a lot of my peers in, in the graduate program. Um, what I learned is the majority were opposite from me. You know, I mentioned I like change. I like, I'm pretty strategic. I live a little bit higher than, um, than um, some. And so I found out that, that these are the individuals who are really drawn to, to get further education. They're really drawn to um, get to be a specialist in their area, right? That's one reason people come back for their advanced degree. So I thought it was really interesting that it, this program that at least I'm in, I didn't do across different um, programs, different MBA programs, but, but looking at those who really wanna dig into the details and really wanna have all the answers that doesn't necessarily make a really good high level leader. There's all levels of leadership too. And I think he was focusing on those running a business. And I think that he's right in the sense of not, the majority are not strategic. And so then what do they do? They go into the details, they go into the financial aspect, and it's hard to kind of get out from under that and say, all right, let's look above all of that and decide, what makes sense for our business. So I thought that was kind of a, an interesting um, example of kind of supporting what he's saying.
I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Yeah, I I agree. I think there often can be too much of a tendency to be um, too financially driven in in our decision making as leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that critique is is a valid one. But your 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 point about like you don't actually need an advanced degree to be a successful leader. Absolutely, I completely right. agree with that. I mean, he's yeah. an example of that. We have examples now. For most people, they're not going to become the next Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or whatever. And so I'm a proponent of you know higher education. Um, to, to level the playing field so people can get opportunity um, and not everyone's going to be a successful entrepreneur. That's yeah. fine, right? Mm-hmm. But certainly there are very uh, incredibly capable, intelligent, uh, ingenious people uh, who, who don't need an MBA or any degree for that matter in order yeah. to be successful in life. I completely agree with that. And so yeah. there's, nothing, there's nothing magical about getting that MBA that's going to help you be successful. Um, it's like anything else in life. You, it's about going through the process, learning about yourself as you go through the, the grind of that kind of a program, um, developing some specific skills and competencies that are going to help you be successful in life. But then it's what you do with it afterwards right. that really matters. Um, and I have to admit, one of, my, one of the things that I, I kind of connected with and resonated, it resonated with me from what he was saying was... Um, you know, if, if you are getting a little bit too much tunnel vision towards the financials, um, are you giving enough attention to the, the people experience, both internally, the, the employees, as well as externally, the customers? Yeah. Um, my general sense is that, yeah, many organizational leaders in the C-suite don't give enough attention to, to those areas. Um, is that because there's a lot of MBAs? I don't know. That's the reason. But but certainly it's, it's, it's a hard thing to, to get you to, to, for us to be able to set aside all of those mechanisms, you know, that drive the financial focus to focus on people. It's a challenge. And, and that's yes. not just an, an MBA issue. It's, 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 it's the way our corporate world is set up, short-term yeah. types of incentives, right? Um, quarterly returns and earnings and trying to look good for the shareholders. I think yeah, that has as much point. to do, I think that has as much to do with it as anything. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the question then becomes, how do you disrupt that um, so that you can focus on those areas that are going to drive the long-term sustainable success of an organization? Yeah. Um, that's, that's a really important question. Another piece that was kind of connected to what, what I think he was saying, it, you know, having someone who's kind of has a broad way of understanding the world and thinking can sometimes allow us to have more um, mindful and considerate approaches towards ethical decision making, right? And how we connect with the, the world. And that's one of the things I've been concerned about seeing trends in recent years over the last couple of decades of uh, how a lot of MBA education has started to reduce or even completely eliminate um, curriculum around uh, ethical decision-making. 
Mm-hmm. And, and then we see all these, I mean, there's nothing new about scandals and there's nothing new about uh, uh, exploitation of, of environment people, consumers. Um, but, but there are some pretty darn high profile cases in recent years. And I just can't help but wonder, we're, we're preparing a lot of people through MBA programs um, who in large part through incentive structures and through the way that education is structured, that they end up focusing on the numbers. They don't end up focusing yeah. as much on the environment or the people, you know, the triple bottom line types of indicators. And ultimately that can lead to negative outcomes for a lot of people. Um, and so that's, yeah. that's something that, you know, it, again, it's not necessarily an MBA thing specifically, but I, I think he makes a good point there. Yeah. And you make me think about, um, you know, what has, what is missing from an MBA program, you know, or any program that's advanced. And I think the ethics piece um, that you mentioned, but as I think about it, we don't have, I didn't have a class on leadership. I had team kind of class, but what's missing is how do you develop people? That's what a leader is. I didn't have any classes on how to develop people. I didn't have anything on emotional intelligence. I didn't have anything on how do you create a vision, mission, and strategy and connect it and drive it through the organization. I learned what a mission, vision, value, you know, what they were, what that components were, but how to do that is, is not there. You've talked before about openness and transparency and the caring aspect um, being important for success of top leaders, I don't see that in programs either. At the same time, I don't think I could be running my business as sex- successfully right now without what I learned. I came in at 28 years old into my MBA program, um, graduated when I was 30, and I was old <laughs> in my class. So if the average is 20, five years old, I don't know if it is still now, but let's just say that's what it was in my class. You know, um, most people at that stage of their career could use some well-rounded education around how a business functions and all the pieces of it. And then how you take that to become a really strong leader, whether it be the leader of the entire company or throughout the the organization, you know, um, that's what you do with it afterward. So I don't think we can blame the MBA programs or the universities, except for I do think that they could improve their content and what they actually are transferring in terms of knowledge so that people realize when they leave their MBA program that leadership is about developing people. That's your first job. It's not the function that you're in. It's not marketing and finance, it's people. So that's what, um, that's how I think it, it also connects, one more thing, to leadership within organizations. I don't think they're good, organizations are not good at developing people either to good leaders. If there's so much missing and that's what my book is about. And so if we don't do it in our advanced programs and we don't do, give it when they come to an organization, where are they gonna get it? That's I think the bigger problem. Yeah, and it is a problem. Where are mm-hmm. they? Where are they going to get it? That's that's a really really great point. So people can try to get it by tuning into podcasts. There's a lot of them, right? right? There's lots of leadership books, you know. So there's there's avenues to gain that kind of content to get uh, to to critically self reflect and 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 to try to build those capabilities. But, but the question is, why wouldn't you do that um, through corporate? development programs? Why wouldn't you do that through traditional higher education programs? Um, And I don't have a good answer for that other than, you know, there's always resource constraints and I think things get squeezed, right? Like I, I, uh, I'm a university professor. I teach both undergrad and, and graduate courses, including MBA courses. I've been on part, I've been on curriculum committees and MBA committees, you know, that determine how the programs are structured and what types of courses are offered and, you know, who gets accepted and all those types of things. And honestly, my experience has been um, that the resource constraints as much as anything dictate uh, a lot of, of what ends up happening. And it's kind of like what happens when you're in a recession. Uh, when, when business is good, 
business, you know, companies like to invest in their people and they like to have training programs and, and those sorts of things. But as soon as things start to tighten up, those are often some of the first things to go. And I've yeah. seen, I've seen that happen within the higher education space too. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, legislatures are reducing budget allocations towards state universities, for example. And so what ends up happening, you start to cut programs or you start to trim back programs, you start to cut out things like, well, do you really need ethical decision making as a class? Because that's just like, you know, you can't really teach someone to be ethical. And so uh, it's just embedded throughout the program. Um, yeah. Or do you, yeah. do you really need a leadership class? Because that's just embedded throughout the program. That's that those, these are the types of conversations I've seen both at my university and at other places. So I know it's happening. And I know that the squeeze ends up pushing some of those things out. Where, when do you get the chance to have um, more specific training on effective communication, on emotional intelligence, on these types of issues that you were describing. Yeah. You know, we just don't have enough of it and, and we yeah. need more of it for sure. Yeah. And I feel like I have one solution to the problem when it comes to the corporations or, or companies, not even just big corporations, but companies as a whole, we're putting billions now into development now. And yet, CEOs and leadership teams, they would all say, I don't, I don't think my people are ready, or I don't know if they're ready. So to me, it's not about the curriculum as much as it is about connectivity of the leadership team to the work that's done in development. Is the people plan connected to the strategic plan? Is it reinforced when they're finished with their learning? Do leaders see it as their job to continue to reinforce and coach this learning. So I don't think what it takes to be a good leader has changed much. You know, um, we still need to communicate well, we need to manage performance, we need to um, have conversations and teach and coach. And so to me, we don't have to change that curriculum as much as we have to change the environment. And I have a tool that actually can can look at some of those things and help a senior team align around what are you doing well? What, what are you missing? Because they have no way to link. If I put more money into development, it's going to get us X, Y, Z. So they say they don't have resources, but I'm not sure that's the problem. I think the problem is that they're not using them in a way. And then they delegate it to HR, which um, I think they're very competent in developing people. But if it's not connected to the leadership team and what they care about, it's just not going to work. So that's kind of what I'm thinking, John. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think you have to be able to connect the ROI, right, of all of these efforts. And to your point, it, it's largely disconnected. Uh, even in some of the, the organizations that do it the best, uh, it's still not as sophisticated as it should be. And so there's it's this disconnect. And you, you can, it's pretty darn easy to see, you know, you roll out a new product or service, you, you track uh, customer um, uh, satisfaction with that and you see sales and then you, yeah. you can make some determinant like it's it's quite clear you know what yeah. the impact is we don't always see that we don't have all that kind of clarity um, oftentimes with the, the people side of things um, that's yeah. not to say that it's not possible it's just oftentimes the the energy isn't put behind it um, mm -hmm. to, to to create an assessment plan and a sustainability plan and to really figure out how are we going to measure this, right? Yeah. Uh, and I don't think they, they see a way to do it differently. And if they did, they would do it differently, you know? And so the, um, yet it's in the top three uh, focus areas for CEOs with any survey I've seen of what do they care about? What are they worried about? It's people development. They know that connection of people being ready to their strategic execution. And again, that's leaders are supposed to develop people so that we can execute the plans. I mean, simple, but not simple, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and well, and it, everything you're saying and, and things that I find myself repeating over and over again on this podcast or in various things that I write, you know, it's just not rocket science. Like it, not a whole lot has changed in terms of effective and successful leadership. There are yeah. key principles that you just need to do consistently right over time and if you do those things you're going to be more successful than not um, and the problem is it takes continual attention it takes sustainability focus um, and 
people just get caught up in the daily grind of whatever they're doing and they lose their focus or they, they start to, you know, their priorities, you know, aren't towards, you know, their leadership development or the development of their people for a variety of reasons. Um, and so it's not rocket science. I, I think that might actually be part of the problem too. Um, mm-hmm. because you know, someone who doesn't have a lot of leadership competencies, but they, they listen to a podcast like this and they say, well, yeah, I get everything they're saying. I totally understand that. And they, they probably even can see examples of where they're doing a lot of the things we're talking about. And so then they think, Oh, I'm good. Uh, yeah. rather, rather than realizing, well, it's, you know, self-awareness, that's the first step, <laughs> you know, and then, and then you build from there. Um, and so it, while it's not rocket science, it does take continual effort and we can build that muscle and that capacity yeah. over time. Uh, and it's not I'm a truly... box you can just check, mm-hmm. you know, and say, okay, I've learned how, how to be a good leader. I'm done. I'm good and move on. And that's why I say it's a lifelong journey, you know, and I think that's what I love about people like Elon Musk is they're going to throw something out there that has some truth to it and is going to cause a little bit of a rise from people. And then we end up talking about it and we can improve it. And I think that's probably why he does it in some ways is to just stir things up. And I think we need to stir up leadership development because it's been done the same way forever and it needs to change to really be effective. So I love that he brought this up and um, that we were able to, to talk through it. Yeah. And I agree. Shaking things up often is a good thing. So in this case, I think that it's a conversation that needs to be had both in the university space and the corporate space for people like us who do consulting work and coaching work with others. Um, So I've really enjoyed this conversation, Jennifer. I know we're short on time um, and I want to be respectful of your time. But before we close, I just want to give you a chance um, to give the final word and share with listeners how they can get connected with you, uh, find out more about your book and anything else that you'd like to share. Absolutely. I think that anyone who works within an organization who cares about leadership um, can benefit from some of the stuff I've written, some of the podcasts I've had and the, and the leaders I've had on there. And, and so they can go to jennifermackin.com, which is M-A-C-K-I-N, jennifermackin.com. And All of my resources are there, including the first chapter of Leaders Deserve Better, a leadership development revolution, so they can um, get a taste of what what I'm putting out there as a potential solution for any company that's trying to improve in their development efforts. So I appreciate the opportunity, John, to talk with other specialists like yourselves in this leadership space because it's, it's more important now than ever before. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. The time flew by. We could go yeah, on and did. on and on all day. Um, <laughs> I, I do hope that listeners will reach out, get connected, check out your book. Um, you know, I, I think Jennifer has a lot to offer everyone and uh, please, please uh, reach out and see what she might be able to do to help you in your organization. Uh, I hope everyone uh, has a great week that you can continue to stay healthy and safe. Uh, and I look forward to talking with you again soon. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.